Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our um, live session. Today we have the privilege of having Professor uh, John Beckford. He is the president of the um, Cybernetic Society. He's a visiting um, lecturer at, the, at UCL, as well as uh, the University of Loughborough. A good friend of uh, Mike Jackson. Um, he, and uh, as we were uh, discussing uh, last week, he's an expert in the use of the viable system model and this idea of uh, management cybernetics. As I present the concept of, uh, of the BSM model, uh, the main idea, according to uh, um, Stafford Beer, is that for uh, systems to be viable, they have to be able to adapt and to adjust to the conditions that the environment imposes, but also systems have the opportunity to redefine the uh, the way the environment is uh, working. Uh, the main concept of the, of the at the core of the viable system model is the idea that in order to be viable, any system needs to perform five different functions, and those are associated with what uh, Professor Bear used to call system one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, again, I assume you all had the opportunity to look at the uh, previous uh, session, and uh, so I'll. Uh, give the uh, microphones, pass on the microphone to Professor uh, Jackson. And as in previous occasions, remember any question you have, please pass it on through the uh, chat option in the Microsoft Teams. And uh, Mike, please carry on. John, you might like to say some preliminary words before I, I start the questioning. Um, good, that would be a relief, wouldn't it? Um, good morning, everybody. Um, Mike's note to me suggested that I might talk for a few minutes before he starts giving me too much of a hard time. Um, so um, and, and I might send you something to read, but instead I sent you a picture um, and it's a slightly baffling picture. But you know, I started my investigations of, of, of the notion of viability about 30 years ago when I was looking for a better way of managing an organization in something like, and I stress something like, real time because of all of the the reporting structures and organization structures and habits and processes of the organizations that I worked in, and I was a, in, in a previous life a banker, um, where there was a huge delay between anything becoming an issue and anybody actually being able to respond to it. And in that, in that delay, all sorts of horrible things went wrong. So um, I was fortunate in meeting Bob Flood, who was then a, a prof at at Hull and, and Bob brought me into the community of systems thinkers by telling me how wrong I was about everything that I that I previously thought. Um, and for me, the VSM is a way of thinking about organization, and, and, and we won't get too hung up on the definition of organization at this point, as a complex adaptive system. So it's complex, so there are many parts in, in, in dynamic interaction. It's systemic because it has properties that belong only to the whole thing and, and not to any of the parts. And it has to be, if it's going to be viable, it has to be adaptive. The, the standard critique, and, I, and I'm sure Roberto has shared this with you because I don't think it's changed terribly much over the last 30 years, of Beer's model was that it was technocratic and it had a, a, a structural focus and we'll still find that sort of critique in the literature today. And that is certainly one way of thinking about and interpreting what, what Stafford had to say. A different reading, I would say a, a, an alternative reading of a lot of his work, demonstrates a massive concern with people, their well-being, their welfare, their interaction. Um, and I've taken over my um, many years of playing with this idea that people dimension is something that we need to, to think about much more um, robustly in the way that we think about the notion of viability in organisations. Because for me, the VSM is more about integrating people, their behaviours and their, and, their, and their values and their beliefs with the processes of the organisation and the mechanism that we use for that is this bizarre thing that we call information. Some of which is, is very hard quantitative stuff and some of which is very soft because it is about values and behaviours um, and, and, and beliefs. So the picture that I then asked you to look at and, and contemplate for some time rather than reading um, 
was an inspiration that came to me when, when writing Intelligent Organization and, and I had to come up with a picture for the cover. Um, and I wanted to try and get across that notion of integration because as Stafford said, people are at the heart of the enterprise. So if you look carefully at that picture, what you will see is that there are two heads which are back to back and those two heads are communicating the series of black dots that, that, that join them together but they're set against a background which first of all is a heart and that the intention is to represent that set of values and behaviors and, and, and beliefs that go with it and against that background is then the structural thing that the, the darkened background of the, of the black background and, and the gray which is indicative of, of some sort of structural artifact sitting behind that right in the middle of the diagram there are three for, for me are the, the critical questions about any any sort of form of organization and its capability to survive. And question one is, why are we doing this? What is the purpose of the system? What is the, the thing to be achieved? The second question um, is, what are we going to do? So if these are the purposes of the organization, these are the things we're setting out to achieve, what are we actually going to do in order to achieve them? And the third question is, and how are we going to do that and that how it gives us a range of options from something which might be very technocratic to something which is very behaviorally based. So we can start st see that that picture is trying to capture the richness that I think Beer was trying to reach for in, hi in his writings and I would say this wouldn't I. Um, I didn't really understand anything that he'd written until I heard him speak. Um, and if I was going to recommend any one of his books to anybody, it would be Designing Freedom rather than any of the other stuff, because Designing Freedom is the book that for me talks about the humanity that underpins the notion um, of, of thinking about organizations as viable systems. In 1976, George Box said, all models are wrong, some are useful. Uh, ten years later, Stafford translated that as model is neither true nor false, but more or less useful. And for me, although I probably started in a position where I thought the VSM was the answer, um, 30 years later, I now rather think it's a device for stimulating a conversation. It's more about helping us to ask the right questions, perhaps, than it is about working out a, a, a best answer. So the real question is, can the VSM be useful as a way of thinking about organization? And here we can look at organization from the individual, which is what I've done in intelligent organization, all the way through, as I've done in intelligent nation, to looking at the whole concept of, of a country and how that might be organized. And we can use that model in three different ways. We can use it to help us diagnose um, faults or diagnose a gap between where we think the organization ought to be, whatever informs that, that, that thinking and where it actually is. We can use it to make prognostications, to make forecasts, suggestions about what we think will happen if we don't do something about the gap that we've identified. And, and Peter Checkland, for example, talked about that when he talks about um, you know, thinking about the future we're currently in. I think that's in, in SSM somewhere. I think that's right, Mike. Um, and we can use it in a therapeutic mode where we can say, if this is the gap, if these are the problems that we are identifying, then here's what some of the things that we might do about them. And some of those things might be behavioral, some of them might be structural, some of them might be informational, Probably a blend of all three is where we would most likely end up. So there's a sort of quick, quick, quick version of that. To put that into, into meaningful word, um, I work with an organization called Fusion 21, which is based in Liverpool. It's a social enterprise, so it, it, its purpose in, in generating profit um, is to, to generate social value. Adopting the mechanisms, rules, guidance, behaviors, and all the other richness that goes with doing the notion of viability, I will call it properly. Um, that organization has a bottom line, which is roughly 50% of its turnover in a sector that would typically operate on a Is that the local minicab firm arriving for somebody? Um, Adopting the rules, the guidance, that the principles of viability allows us to build an organization which is phenomenally efficient. That efficiency has to be rooted in something which is phenomenally effective. In other words, is the organization achieving the things it set out to achieve? And the second question is, and is it doing that, that efficiently? Fusion 21 um, 
is is massively successful both in fulfilling the need for for um, improvement in social housing and in making a profit doing so and turning that profit into into social value particularly through generation of employment and that's a small organization with 35 people six or seven million turnover the sisters of nazareth um is a an order of 300 um, elderly nuns, and they are all elderly, they won't mind me saying, so I think their average age is, is 70 something now, who ran 37 care homes in seven countries dotted around the planet, um, running a business with 100 million turnover. When I first encountered them, they were certainly not viable financially, and actually organisationally, they were not viable either and a short term think about where they were suggested that in five years or so, they would probably have failed as an organization and collapsed. Far from that, 10 years on, having redesigned the organization with the sisters and their lay staff, and in many cases, a number of the residents, a redesign of the organization, a recreation of that organization along the lines of viability. They're now A, sustainable organizationally, and B, they're sustainable financially. So the transformation of the organization. And that's been really interesting because it's a very, very highly distributed organization to, to, to put that in context. Um, if you're in the Australasian region, there's an eight hour time difference between the, the, the operation in Western Australia versus the one in, in Melbourne, which means that you, know, you have to be able to distribute decision making in a very, very real way because you can't do it any any, any other way. Um, so that's you know, hugely successful. Bringing it back to the UK, um, we've been adopting these ideas and using them in, in the development of national infrastructure for the last 10 years or so. Um, and and the, the language that was first adopted in 2009 for the then, I think it was the Brown government, um, was this idea of a system of systems, thinking about the infrastructure of the UK. This was the, the, the physical infrastructure, electricity and gas and road networks and all that, um, as an integrated system of systems. And how might we think about that using the notion of viability? Um, and so you know, its purpose is to, to generate or you know, to enable the generation of economic value and, and, and social justice. One of the very specific things that came out of that work was this thing we have now called the National Infrastructure Commission, um, which I have to say is not itself viable. Um, I've, it's, it's full of economists, which is one of its major problems. Um, but that was a product of actually a, a piece of research that said there has to be a better way of being able to, to think about and organise infrastructure projects and investment at a national level. And that, that emerged from it. Um, Currently, I'm working with Network Rail, uh, and you will have heard of them because they, they run the permanent way for all the railway systems in the country. And we're using the VSM and cybernetics in general to design now what will be a management information system um, to enable large scale organizational change around the ability of the railway to adapt to seasonal changes, which it currently can't do. Uh, and of course, that's, you know, that's massively challenging from a, a technical content point of view, because there's 20,000 miles of railway and, and um, it's broken up into however many operational route sections of, of 500 meters long that, that amounts to, but it's a lot. Um, and the idea of that is to develop this thing called a seasonally agnostic railway, which would be in effect a viable railway one, which is capable of adaptation to changes in the weather. Um, but, uh, but the realization is that once you've built that structure that lets you adapt to weather, you can also adapt to all sorts of other external um, influences and indeed um, generate internal changes, which you can then push back out into the environment. A consequence of that piece of work, and, and I just briefly mentioned this to Mike, is that we are likely to be offering a couple of PhD studentships um, later this year. Um, locations to be finally decided, but one of those will be looking at you know, cybernetics in general and probably the VSM in particular and how it informs the development of the model. The other will be looking at how we can take that concept out into public policy in a more general way. So the, you know, I think the last time you know, cybernetics and public policy really met each other in a big way was in, in 1973 in Chile um, and, and we are, we're now back to being able to think about that um, again. So that's very pleasing. I'm going to wrap up in about two minutes, Mike. Um, so my latest book is called Intelligent Nation, and um, Mike sort of hinted that I might want to talk a little bit about that. 
So this was my interpretation, and it is a, a reinterpretation of the notion of viability and the viable systems model, looking at you know, the nation as a whole, whereas Stafford looked, in, in, certainly in Chile, at, at you know, the industrial economy, if you like. Um, if our pursuit of viability requires a synth synthesis of people, process and information, then understanding how we might do that at a national level is quite challenging. What for me makes it possible is that we underpin our conversation about viability by thinking in terms of the shared values that we evolve together. And a nation um, is in, to some extent, an expression of the shared values. Even if there are differences and, and, and disputes, there's sort of a, a range of stuff that we all generally agree on and there's some bits probably around the edges where, where we need to do some work. So the development of a set of shared values requires a dialogue. So we can't have viability unless we can have dialogue in that sense. If we're democratic and, we, we're, and, and if we're not democratic, we can't be viable. So that's a, an argument that we can pursue at some point. Um, we have to be able to make choices and in order to make choices, we have these structures that we call elections. Um, and they're all pretty ropey. It doesn't matter which particular system you adopt. None of them work terribly well. Um, but nonetheless, there are mechanisms by which by which the, the way people wish to, to see their country work can be expressed in terms of government. Without that choice, government of a country is not legitimate. Without the democratic engagement of the population in deciding who's going to govern them on on what terms, there is no legitimacy to to government. Viability depends on legitimacy of governance. So in order to, if we go back to, to, to what Roberta was saying right at the beginning, when Stafford describes um, the five different systems, he describes the viability when he says that the um, identity of the organization articulated as he described it, system five is shared with system one and our democratic mechanism is the, is, is the device if you like by which we can test whether the values are shared between the governed and the governors and hence we can have a viable nation feels like a good point to shut up thank you thanks john um, a great introduction and I know the students have also had uh, quite a lot of input from Roberto on the on the structure of the viable system model. Uh, you put that into context to some degree. Um, so perhaps we could, it's better to talk round about the model rather than talk about it in detail. Um, so let, let's start by going back a bit. You're, you're president of the UK Cybernetics Society. Um, Nowadays, people tend to associate cybernetics with 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 robots, um, automated factories, um, artificial intelligence, perhaps. What 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 cybernetics got to do? How is it relevant to, for students of business and and management? And how does it come to give rise to the viable system model? Um, okay, that's, so that for me, there are sort of kind of three three bodies of of, of knowledge associated with cybernetics, there's three bodies of interpretation, one of which would be, as you say, the, the, you know, the space of robotics and automation. And we're all familiar with that through thermostats, through toilet flushes and all sorts of other devices in our worlds that, that, that um, maintain themselves under control in the act of going out of control, which is, which is really um, the thing we're talking about there. Over on the other extreme side, we've got you know, we've got you know, the artificial intelligence stuff and, and the notion of being able to embed in um, information systems the ability to decide. And in principle, in practice, it's very different. In principle, it's no different to a toilet flush. In, in, in that sense, we're embedding a, a set of decisions that we have already made into a system that then tests whether the data stands up to that decision or not. So that's a, a gross simplification of, of AI, obviously. Um, sitting in the middle of that and most relevant and most important, I think, to, um, to to students of business is that we need a language which enables us to describe in a relatively neutral fashion what is going on inside of, of, of an organisation um, and 
being able to explore that and cybernetics and particularly the language of organizational cybernetics provides us with a language where we can we can describe the interactions of either people or systems or both inside the organization in such a way that we can take it out of the he said she said and actually almost put the organization on the wall and describe what is happening rather than being seen to um they call it attack individuals to describe individuals behavior we can describe the system behavior and we can have a develop a shared interpretation of what's going on using that language when we look at the model itself there are parts of it that are more useful than, than others in, in some senses and if i was extracting a bit i would be really interested in extracting the thing that that stafford called the meta system um, and, and so this is the system three, system four, system five, because that's the mechanism by which I interpret the VSM as offering a mechanism for decision making. Because what's going on is, on the one hand, um, at system three level, it's saying, you know, we're busy doing this, look how successful we are. At system four, somebody's saying, yeah, but it's all going to be different tomorrow. And that sets up a tension between those, those two things. Then the notion of system five identity is saying here is a mechanism by which we can dissolve that tension because we can look at who we are what are our values what are our beliefs what are our principles that we're adopting and that lets us unlock that argument between system three and system four we're saying well the right thing to do is x and that's a values driven thing rather than a technically driven thing when we sit in the boardroom of an organization, and I have the, the privilege of doing that on a very regular basis, the conversation um, has to be about the why. The decision making is all about the values, the technical stuff of making, you know, shall we build a new nuclear power station? Whatever, it's, it's actually trivial. The complex question is, why are we doing this? What are the things that are important to us? So. If we then step back down and we go from the from the level of the boardroom into the factory uh, and I'm in the process of, of helping a factory set up at the moment. We can look at also the viability of a team working within a factory environment or working within a delivery environment and we're busy you know, a particular organization I'm thinking of is is a new organization building houses using modern methods of construction. If we want the team that are building the housing units in a factory to itself be viable as a team, we have to also recognize that whilst the time horizon is different, they're making, you know, they're making uh, panelized walls today, they're creating a whole housing unit. You know, what they're playing with is, is a time horizon of three or four hours or a day till the job is done. They're thinking about where they are now, where they want to be tomorrow, why they're doing the things they're doing in the order they're doing them. So they, again, they have a local meta system which is constrained by its membership of the higher order organization, which is the factory, but nonetheless has freedom within a, a constrained set of, of rules, if you like, to maintain its own viability in, in that context. So these are really useful devices for thinking about the way that we as, as then senior managers intervene in organizations to, to drive their capability. Good stuff. Um, just from the point of view of the, the students, John, uh, John, I'd like to uh, you to say a few words about this issue. The, the students studied, studied so far have done um, hard systems thinking um, and uh, system dynamics uh, and the vanguard method. Um, and Stafford certainly well, he start, knew a lot about operational research. He was president of the OR Society, but he saw cybernetics uh, as an advance on on those approaches, Vanguard wasn't around at the time, but certainly in terms of OR operational research, it was an advance because for him, cybernetics was dealing with exceedingly complex probabilistic systems. Um, you'd like to say about a little bit about that and, and how perhaps how it's different from hard systems thinking and why he might have thought it thought of it as an advance. <laughs> When we were talking to my father about this a, a long time ago, because um, uh, he was, amongst other things, um, quite capable in, in, in OR, and we were talking about um, universities and the origins of OR, and he was, you know, he was, he was doing this stuff in the dockyards in the, in the Second World War, um, when 
creative, thoughtful people were getting together and, and looking at difficult problems and bringing together multiple disciplines to, to, to generate insights that allowed them to, um, to, to tackle previously unseen problems. So in their day, complex problems which, which didn't lend themselves to, to traditional methods of, of, of resolution. Um, Post-war, we decided we ought to teach this stuff. Um, and so we, we, we turned OR into much more of a, of a professional discipline. It created structures and rules and all sorts of things, and then started teaching standard models. So within the OR environment, there are a whole bunch of things that we can teach people how to do, which are in essence no more complex than, than sort of uh, yeah, basic arithmetic in, in, in many senses. And we did that because it enables us to standardize what is learned and standardize the testing of what is learned. So we can find out whether the students we've taught, and there's 80 odd of them here today, um, have remembered the stuff that we decided was important. What we, um, we might even test their ability to apply what we thought we taught them to known problems. But what we lose then is that initial ability that we had when, when, the, when the, if you like, the, the discipline of OR was very new to actually understand that this is a novel problem. So our students might learn how to apply, apply rules. They don't understand, they don't learn how to solve problems because we actually haven't taught them that bit. When we now look at the problems, the challenges that we face in, in, in sort of 2021, the exceedingly complex system that has, has it probably, always, I'm sure it always existed, um, and part of Stafford's drive might have been that recognition that the tools we were using were, were, were inadequate. But what's now happening is that we have so much richness in our inter interactions, so much dynamism in our interactions, so much change happening outside the system that we're studying, um, that actually there's a sense in which we can never quite solve a problem and all we can ever do is, is um, manage the mess. I think that was Checkland as well, wasn't it? Creative mess management, I think he called it that at some point. We can't solve a problem anymore. We can ameliorate a situation. We can guide it and steer it and, and, and try to take it somewhere. Now, obviously, if we're building a, a, a mobile phone or a, or a 747, everything in it has to be describable. Everything in it has to be repeatable and reliable and so on. Otherwise, it kind of doesn't work as an aircraft. But in principle, any one of us, given the, the materials and an instruction book, could assemble a 747 or a 777. Um, what we couldn't do is meaningfully recreate this conversation because even with just three of us, that, you know, let alone the other 80 odd people um, you know, listening to it and engaging in it, what I bring to it, um, what you bring to it, what they bring to it um, means that our, our, the meaning we take out of it, it can be vastly different. And of course, our modern organisations are societies, for want of a better expression they are made up of people in, in rich interaction so they are indescribably complex even from the level of, of two or three people um, in, engaged with them yeah so it's, it's arguable i guess that although the, the viable system model was around before the the concept of the the vuca uh, world was invented it, it, it's actually it's actually a model which is very appropriate for dealing with this volatility and uncertainty complexity and ambiguity it, it it seeks to it seeks to set up an organization so it can change and adapt it can be sort of anti-fragile in in the context of uh, events that we couldn't have known in advance i guess as be, be constantly said about it oh well, absolutely and i think the the, the whole notion that um you know, we should be thinking about it and, and anticipating that um the environment that we're continually investigating around us in our organization is changing and we're continually re-asking the question how do i need to adapt to what i'm seeing happen around me and second question how do i adapt what is happening around me to meet my needs so we have this sort of dual set of questions going on the whole time and and um, so so we're continue as human beings we continually adopt our adapt our posture 
to, to our environment and sometimes we adapt our environment to our posture by leaning on a wall or whatever we, we, we create forms of temporary stability so so we're almost in a position of, of allostasis as opposed to homeostasis so our stability is dynamic rather than rather than static and that's you know when you think about what's happening in a, in a modern organization um, and you know, when I started my PhD, the first chapter talks about the perpetually failing problem solving engine, the, the notion that in an organization, um, you know, we recognize that, that, that we're working with the model of the world. We recognize there are deficiencies between the model that we've created and the world that we experience that so we propose to take action to resolve it. Um, and, and I will tell you about Network Rail here. Um, they. The, the reason that the, the work I'm doing has been driven is because every year they do a seasonal performance review, which um, runs about six months behind seasonal performance. So their ability to recognize that it snowed this morning and do something about it has a time lag of about a week. So by the time they've realized it snowed and they've done something about it, they're, they're, you know, they're too damn late. Similarly, their information flow is such that um, although they get really, I mean, they get really good, highly granular weather data about you know, about tiny sections of the track, but their ability then to influence the timetable in sufficient time to adapt the train service to the incoming weather is is too slow. So they they they're, they're having to be eight days out in order to make a timetable decision and the weather accuracy is only sort of sufficiently good three days out to be doing anything meaningful so they're forever doing the wrong thing which is passengers pisses us off um so we need to you know, so, so the work we're doing so how do we collapse that time how do we improve the flow of information how do we understand the decision making in the organization in such a way that the, that we no longer have a 38 page report to an ewat um but we actually make a decision on the basis of the information we've got available to us now in order to make sure make sure that it trains this afternoon because that surely is the point <laughs> of the exercise yeah, a great. Yeah, the real time um, essentialist element of the of the model. Roberto, have you got any questions? Yes, yes, we do. Um, one of the questions from Paul, he asked, um, how can you use the viable system model in a uh, for a public government agency like the network rail when the controlling body is more concerned about how the public sees them? Uh, from a political sort of perspective, rather than on, rather than on making the best decisions, uh, how difficult it is to use the, the, the viable system model under those conditions? Um, I fully anticipate that over the course of the two year contract with Network Rail, which, which hopefully will get extended, it might well equally get terminated um, because you know, the, the nature of the conversation that, that, that you're having in an organization like that, um, you know, it wants immediate answers because it's feeling pain, if you like, and it's feeling pain from its political masters, from its funding bodies. So there's an engagement process with, with, with the, the boards and the performance boards and the operating boards um, where using the ideas of, of, of viability and particularly the structural um, capabilities of it, we're able to separate levels of decision making. So we can understand that there is something we might do at an operational root section level, which will deliver a benefit, but the echo of that benefit won't be felt by the board for six months. But we can have a conversation with the board that says, we're doing this down here and over in six months time, you will get that. And no, you can't have it any sooner because, or yes, you can have it sooner, throw more money or fish or whatever seems appropriate as a, as a means of, of moving it on. We also use the, 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 the model as a tool, um, and literally when I sit in my office here at home and I have a big whiteboard on the wall and I scribble on it. And one of the reasons for scribbling on the whiteboard in a conversation with other people is to be able to move the conversation to talk about the thing rather than the dialogue between the individuals. So we objectify the organization by using the model of pulling it out. So it's not about a debate between two or more individuals. It's about this shared thing. So we seek to develop a shared understanding of the world. I wouldn't say necessarily common, but certainly shared. We can have different understandings um, and we use the differences in our understandings to explore tensions and, and, and difficulties. Um, and this is the sort of, you know, Stafford would probably have regarded as very impure use of the model in that, in that sense, because it's a mechanism for having that conversation that I talked about a, li a little earlier. Um, I have 
been in the position of, of sitting in the boardroom of a large public corporation and, and pointing out to the chief executive and the chairman that the biggest problem that the organisation was experiencing was them. Um, and, and that's you know, and you come back to that sort of political level um, to do this. Certainly to do it you know, commercially successfully, to do it for a living, you have to be brave enough, um, you have to be strong enough in, in your views and your understanding to be able to, to locate the problem in, in individuals when it's necessary. And you can use the tool to actually help you have that conversation. Because if you think about what, what Pete Dudley calls the trialogue, the three, four, five homeostat, which Pete Dudley structures in a very different different way because um, it brings those three parts of the conversation together so when you're then with the chief executive or the politician responsible and you're saying but you know, the reason this is happening in my observation is you know, you're not making this decision or the decision you're making here is imposing an artificial constraint down there which generates these they can either accept it or not but at least you've got a language for, for, for talking about it um, and, and I've, you know, I've done this in, in hospitals are really good examples. I've, I've done this with, with uh, University College Hospital in London, uh, where we, we halved the dwell time for patients in, in the emergency department. By partly by thinking about process, partly by thinking about information flow, partly by educating people around around the ways that wave, waves work, but actually mainly by engaging people in the conversation about how it might get fixed. It was mainly about using this device to inform a different conversation and that whether you do it at the level of public policy or you do it at the level of, of tightening the bolts on a fish plate on a railway line it's all about understanding and engaging people in owning the outcomes that you're seeking to create you cannot impose viability on anything you can build viability through that process of engagement Okay, that's really good. Uh, and another question is uh, very much on, online with your uh, book. And the question is whether all these concepts of devolution and independence uh, actually increase viability, the process of devolution, and whether eventually independence will reduce viability for both Scotland and, uh, and the UK as it is. Wow, oh, what a great question. Love that. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Um, Uh, was it Shakespeare? No man is an island. Um, you know, however much we may claim our ind independence from Europe and how much Scotland, Northern Ireland, um, Wales may want to claim their independence from, from London. Um, yeah, the reality is that we are all in a set of interdependent relationships with each other. Um, so we can't have complete separation. Um, when the Blair government um, started the process of, of devolution uh, as they've described it in sort of 1999 they made the most unholy mess of it um, and it has never been fully resolved and I think that they made a mess of it because they wanted to seek political appeasement rather than actually think about a meaningful structural device which would give greater autonomy within the regions and I think prior to that um, John Prescott is a famous Hull MP now Lord Prescott had attempted to come up with the governments of the regions the nine regional governments that were being talked about in the, in, in the late 90s and, and, and that was a strategy that, that failed too um, so however much we we um, we may want to devolve stuff and I do want to devolve stuff to much more local level what we always set up in in, in any form of, of, of system of autonomy is we set up a tension between the parts and the whole and if we understand that we're setting up a tension then we also understand that the discussion we have is all about managing the tension it's recognizing and accepting that we are you know, that, that Scotland Northern Ireland Wales England are all part of this thing called the United Kingdom and that the autonomy that they should have, the autonomy we should have as citizens, um, has to be a function of a continuing negotiation rather than a set of a, a set of decisions. Um, when uh, Henri Fayol talked about this in 1916 when he talked about you know, centralization or decentralization as being you know, a continuing negotiation and that increasingly is the case. The challenge we have at the moment 
is it's so much more easy to centralize everything than it used to be because we use electronic means to, to, to do so. Uh, but in doing so, whether it's in an organizational or political sense, we disenfranchise people to the extent that we actually force a disengagement on them. So, uh, so my passion, and I'm, I'm very proud of my, my children, um, because although they're terribly grown up now, um, they engage with the political process and they fight for the things that they, that they believe in. And my biggest fear for the next generation is a complete disengagement for the democratic process. And then we will have a collapse of, of a complete collapse of, of viability. Um, but we need to have a much richer conversation about what we mean by devolution, about what we mean by autonomy, about what we mean by freedom, um, than frankly any of the governments or politicians in them are capable of having, let alone willing to have. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think that's a really interesting reflection. Um, uh, I have another question from Alina, and uh, her question is, when redesigning an organization, where do you start? How do you start adapting the ideas of VSM? Is it all about the conversation and dialogue at the first? Question one always has to be about purpose. Okay. So, for example, yeah, yeah, uh, right at the beginning, as I was talking and uh, chatting with, with Mike, um, you know, what do we mean by a cybernetic system? Well, cybernetic systems are, are adaptive, but more importantly, they're purposeful. So, that's, so the thing that a cybernetician, cybernetician imputes to an organization is this notion of purposefulness. Um, what human beings bring to that purposefulness is intent. And that's, you know, that's so, so we can have a purposeful system in the sense of a, of a sort of toilet flush, and that's fine. It, it acts to work in a particular way. What human beings bring to that is intent. We want things from our purposeful system. So the, the, the beginning of the conversation with, with any, any executive is, what is it you think you're trying to achieve and why do you think you're trying to achieve it? So with the Sisters of Nazareth, um, it was a really interesting conversation because being nuns and, and being very, very reflective, um, they actually had a, a, a coherent and meaningful answer, which was you know, the purpose of the system is the care of the poor and needy. That was, that was it. That was the whole thing. So we then had this enormously entertaining conversation about what that might mean. And of course, what it might mean in, in Southern Africa, in, 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 in Zimbabwe or, or Cape Town, um, is different to what it might mean in California, because the notion of poor and needy shifts with the environmental and, and, and economic context in which that mission is being expressed. So by being able to sort of come up with this, 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 this grand statement in a sense of care of the poor and needy, we could understand that very differently in London to Melbourne to, to Port Elizabeth. Um, so, the, so the AIDS clinic um, for orphans in, in Cape Town and the care home for the elderly in West London fulfilled the same purpose, but did very, very different things. So once you've got your mind around, this is, this is the difference we're trying to make in the world, it becomes, I wouldn't say easy, but it becomes you know, sensible to be able to have a guess. What, what are the processes that we engage in in order to fulfill that, that express purpose? And you can have a, a sort of a, a reflective conversation about, what makes that purpose legitimate? And I, I, I do that quite a lot because you know, you, you, if, if somebody turns around, they often do say, well, the, you know, the purpose is to make money. Well, why? You know, what's the purpose of, of the money? So actually, you know, if you're, you, know, and you, you can then challenge people and say, well, actually, what you just said is the purpose of the system is to make you rich as opposed to to make money because you know, everything you're doing is about making you personally rich. Now, So John's coming back. Yes. I think I'm coming back. Yep, you're back. Okay. Um, that's teams for you, isn't it? Yeah. Um, is the purpose that the individual is seeking to... So there's a values-led conversation about the legitimacy of the purpose as described. And, and you can use various... I, mean, I particularly like strategic assumption surfacing and testing as, as, a, as a device for having that conversation that says, mm, you say it's about this, but the way I experience or observe the organization, it actually appears to be about that. So, so you know, what is it that's really informing 
the, the choices that you're making. And, and, and as a practitioner, I have walked away from clients and I will continue to walk away from clients if I don't think that the purposes that they seek to fulfill, um, let's be in my, you know, fit and consistent with my values and, and beliefs. Um, so that's, you know, that can lead to an entertaining conversation. It's brilliant. Uh, and Mike, do you want to add something before we uh, close the session? Um, yeah, I probably want to to go up to the, the level of um, nations uh, to give John a chance to talk about his very recent book, The Intelligent Nation, but also to pick up on something that he said, which, which was that um, as we get more and more information technology, we, we're, we're better able to centralise things. Of course, there's a sense in which you're also better able to decentralise things. And, and this, the most famous experiment with the viable system model was in, in Chile. Uh, and there, uh, Allende's government, although Marxist and socialist, was looking for a, a real alternative to the Soviet model, which was highly centralised, although it was stated at some stages to be based upon cybernetics. Now, Beer believed that you could decentralise um, a socialist economy and give a fair degree of autonomy to the different levels and sectors and down to the factories and, and all the rest of it. But he was working with incredibly primitive uh, electronic uh, equipment. Now, given the, the, the sort of um, technology we have today, it, it seems to me that that kind of vision that uh, he had for Chile uh, is much more realistic um, and that we do potentially have uh, the information and the capacity to handle information to such an extent they can almost replace uh, the market so in a sense i think um you're getting a lot of interest in cybernetics uh, in beer's work uh, as a means of uh, of somehow being reconstructing capitalism or even moving to a post-capitalist society based upon decentralization and the replacement of the market by decentralized information flows and um, that's quite an exciting prospect in a way and you, you hint upon you hint upon it, some of it in in the intelligent nation I wonder about your comments if you could comment on that now um so uh, i'll have to try and remember that. i think it was buckminster fuller but it might have been stafford beer so it is one of those mornings um that said, yeah, the only guarantee of our freedom is the incompetence of government in relation to, to, to yeah, the information it holds about us. And, and what we're living through at the moment with COVID is, is a really interesting example of that. Um, when I went for my injection last week, I got, I got asked who I was about five bloody times before I got the needle in my arm. And, uh, um, so we have this mechanism, we have these tools which enable us to collect lots and lots of lots and lots of data, let's, let's call it as opposed to, to information. Um, but we're actually, fortunately, in some senses, we're really, really bad at using it. The technology does enable a much more distributed control if we choose there's a stress here if we choose to have distributed control if we choose to have centralized control it enables exactly it enables that so yeah. it is not so much about the technology as the way that we choose to use it and i think uh, veena talked about that as a, as a, um yeah, nothing inherent in the in the technology which is either good or bad it was how human beings chose to to use it that, that was important so again we come back to we the citizens have to make a choice and have to engage our government in, in, in the making of the choice about the extent to which we want to distribute power within our, our communities. So there's an obligation on us as individuals to participate in the democracy that we have and to own the outcomes. Maybe there's an obligation on us to get involved politically in order to, to inhibit the general tendency towards centralization within dynamic systems and we do observe um, you know, I mean, at the moment I have a blog half written on my desktop um, which says you know dear Boris you're asking the wrong question because when we look at what the government's doing at the moment what it's what it's asking itself is to what extent can we release some of the constraints that we've imposed upon the population over the last 12 months the question they should be asking is to what extent can we continue to impose any of these restrictions so actually, it should be about you know, what's the legitimacy of any of the restrictions 
at this point, so which minimal set do we need to, to put in place? Um, if you were characterizing things as socialistic and capitalistic, I suspect the socialistic questions tend to centralize and the capitalistic questions tend to distribute. But that's probably a, that's a, that's a, a stark characterization, which is probably a bit unfair. But it's, you know, but, you know, Stafford said all systems end up in totalitarianism. So whether you go left or right, you end up with you know, somebody in the centre you know, seeking to grasp the decisions away. Um, you, know, you laugh at the moment. Um, I would like in our democracy to see that every individual citizen was equipped with the tools, and I mean you know, the technological tools, but also the thinking equipment and the knowledge and the access to public services that enabled each individual to in effect design their own public service. And certainly for all the rules based things we do around tax and social welfare benefits and, and so on, that ought to be something that we make possible. And in doing so, we can then distribute control within a system which is which is set up to, to, to let that happen. Um, when you look at the announcements of the government over the last couple of weeks, we're going to put a tax office in Newcastle and we're going to put a work and pensions office in West Midlands and, and so on. Um, where the people sit, as we've discovered over the last 12 months, is pretty much irrelevant. It's who's making the decision that matters. We could equally outsource the operation of, of public services to India, as we have done in many parts of the, of the private sector. If the decision is still being made by somebody in central government, then the decision is cent still centralised, regardless of where the data factory is, happens to be to be placed. So there's a huge philosophical challenge in there, Mike. I think you'll find I think you'll find that it's only fairly junior people in the treasury who eventually end up in Darlington. <laughs> in, in the, in the, in the decision makers will remain. But you, you're touching on some very interesting questions there, because uh, in a sense, uh, there are questions which distort. Uh, the way that you can use the model and, and I think one of the questions earlier was 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 alluding to that so unless you do something about um, say the digital divide the way that some people have access and are able to use new technology uh, and others are deprived of it of, of its use for one reason or another uh, then it becomes possible impossible to employ the, the model in any kind of democratic um, yeah. way to Im improve um, society so one of the things Fusion 21 is doing is, um, as, as part of its contribution to this, is we are looking at, uh, we, we already deal with, with um, energy poverty as one of the one of the things we do with the, the surpluses we generate. Second one we're looking at is digital inclusion and how do we design and build communities um, of homes where digital inclusion is a given rather than an, an, an added extra. Yeah. Um, because until you start to do that, you're, you're stuck. But my daughter-in-law um, is a primary school teacher, and this is the sort of the real challenge in some senses. Um, my daughter-in-law is, is a primary school teacher in Norfolk. She teaches year one and two, and um, she has children turning up in her class who are not potty trained. So children at five and six years old who cannot use a toilet properly. How difficult is it to educate that young child into the sort of citizen that we're describing if the parental situation is such that some of the basics of being a being a, a human being almost in, in, in a modern society are being neglected so we have some really really significant challenges um, one of which is digital inclusion but actually part of it is about you know, having an education system that actually Gener helps us generate citizens who are capable of fulfilling their obligations to themselves um, in in the society that's emerging. Mm -hmm. Roberto, have you got any more questions? Uh, well, yeah, we have uh, uh, some questions about the sometimes uh, difficult it is for particularly small organizations to have people associated with specific functions. That in the small organization, sometimes you have people doing the functions of system three, the, the auditing function and the intelligence function at the same time. Or being the same people doing the, or having this kind of a collapse between two different uh, systems. Uh, how challenging it is, the question is, to work with this type of organizations, or is it the case that these organizations uh, are not necessarily fulfilling all the criteria to implement the VSM model? 
Um, oh, I'm not sure there are any criteria in a, in a meaningful sense. Um, so um, each of us as an individual needs to think of ourselves as a viable organisation. So we have purposeful things that we do. We, we do work, we do education. We may be a father, a grandfather, a teacher, a consultant or whatever. So there are purposeful things that we do. Um, but actually, we all have our own personal meta system. So we have a set of values and beliefs um, that, that would reflect our identities of our own personal system five. We have things that we currently do, which we manage and regulate, and we'll call them system three, what I call managing the present, where we balance our resources across the various sets of activities that we've committed ourselves to. And um, certainly at a physiological level, in order to walk across a room or across a road, we have to have a system four operating that says, oh, look, there's a threat over there, I'd better avoid it. But we, we can look at ourselves and say, you know, I am currently you know, um, this, I would like to, to do these things in the future, I would like to be that in the future, therefore I need to acquire this information, or I need to get these consents or whatever. So actually, every one of us should be looking at our own personal better system and kind of going, there are multiple roles within me that I fulfil at different times and I have my personal uh, conversation, my metasystemic conversation that says, why am I doing this? And why is this important to me? When we then look inside an organisation and, and in my other book, Intelligent Organisation, there's, there's a section called, it's Tuesday, I must be Kate. Um, and that was about a, a small organisation um, and my wife was going off to, to, to work in it. It was, it was a school and I said to her, what are you doing today? And the answer was, it's Tuesday, I must be Kate, because she was going into the organisation to fulfil a particular role within it. So this understanding that you know, we're not talking about fixed positions on an organisation chart. We're not talking about an organogram that says Fred reports to Doris and Doris reports to Charlie and, and, and so on. We're talking about how am I going to be me within the organisational context that I'm describing? And in doing so, recognise that those three dimensions of me are playing out the whole time. In my, in my other worlds, um, I exist as a director of a charity. So legally, I have, a, I have a directorial role with certain obligations and requirements. When I'm actually out with the other volunteers in the charity delivering the charitable activities, I might be acting as a marshal by moving cones around. I might be sitting in a car being an instructor. I might be a course leader. I'm still always John Beckford, but I fulfill different roles at different times. When we can understand those different roles and start to articulate them, then the, actually the model makes a lot more sense apart from anything else. But we're also able to help people understand why certain conversations do or don't happen, why certain outcomes do or don't happen, because we have this, this ability to say, well, when I'm in this role, I'm being that. And when I'm being that, this language, these decisions become appropriate and legitimate. When I'm being something else, that, that, that changes. So again, it is back to, you can't, in a sense, you can't train people in VSM. You have to create a context in which they can start to educate themselves. And in creating that very, very rich uh, dialogue, the structural artifacts start to emerge rather than, rather than the other way around. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. So even if you're a one person business, to give another example, you have to be looking to the the way that the five functions operate. If you're, yeah. if you're yeah. a green grocer, you've chosen that as your purpose. You have to look to the market and what the prices of the products are. You have to allocate resources to uh, vegetables and uh, fruits and apples and, uh, uh, and and oranges. And you you know, that all the same rules still apply yeah. even if you're a one person business. and and you're doing all those roles yourself, in fact. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, that's what we have time for. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been really uh, a wonderful conversation to have you, Professor Beckford. Uh, I really uh, appreciate all the time for for allowing us to to share your your knowledge with us. Uh, the students are really asking uh, several questions. Uh, you address a few of them as you were uh, describing and answering some, some other uh, questions we had. So thank you very much. I'll uh, post the name of your uh, new book on Canvas for the students if they want to know more about it. And uh, again, thank you very much. And Mike, again, uh, thanks. Uh, hey, thank also. You, and uh, I'll see you guys uh, during the recall session this week and live session next th this coming Monday.